Welcome to the second video about uh, structuring classes. This time we're going to talk about classes and some more advanced things you can do with structures. So classes are a special kind of types or propositions in Lean, uh, where Lean will automatically to try to find the inhabitants of this type or class without you having to specify it uh, explicitly. So as an example, I'm going to develop in this section um, a class uh, saying that uh, a natural number n is a square, so a square of another natural number. And I'm going to use this to define a square root function for which is only uh, defined for squares. So as you know, in Lean, we tend to um, try to make all functions total, but it is not strictly necessary. It is also possible to um, only define functions uh, if some hypotheses hold. And we can even try to um, try to uh, let Lean figure out those set conditions automatically. And, and one way to do that is with classes. So um, so here we uh, uh, declare that is square is a class just by writing this add class in front of it. This is called an attribute. So I'm giving is square the class attribute. Um, and so far that doesn't do much yet. Um, so the next thing is we're going to define a square root. So we're taking a natural number n and we're uh, assuming that n is a square and we're putting them in these square brackets and these square brackets mean that lean will automatically try to figure out from the context uh, an inhabitant of this type so when applying square root to a natural number uh, lean will automatically uh, fire a simple search procedure to figure out whether the natural number you took the square root of is uh, the square of another natural number. Uh, and this is an implicit argument. So you don't have to, have to, have to give this argument explicitly. Um, and so we can treat the square root as a unary function, but really it takes two arguments um, and uh, uses this second argument to define the square. So the definition of the square root is called classical.sum of hn. And what this does is, well, hn is a proof that there exists a case such that k squared is n. And classical does sum just says, well, take some k set aside its property. Of course, in this case, this k is unique. Uh, so in this case, it's really take the unique k such that k squared is equal to n. Um, and so that's how we define the square root. So next, we declare a nice prefix. Uh, notation for the square root so that we can write this apply to n for the square root. Uh, and then we have uh, the defining property of the square root. Namely, if we take the square root of n and then square root, then of course we get n back. Uh, and that's uh, just, uh, we use this lemma, which is basically, well, the classical that some we choose, well, it, we don't know what value it is, but it is some value that satisfies this defining property. So it's some k that satisfies this k squared is equals n. So here, I have the square root of n squared is equal to n. That's how I defined the square root function. And notice here that I'm applying the square root of n, and Lean has automatically figured out what the second argument of the square root was. Uh, which is to prove that n is a square. And in this case, the proof is very easy uh, because again, I provided this hn saying that n is a square. So it just, it just took that hn from the context and filled it in the square root function as an implicit argument. Um, and yeah, so in the exercises, I'm asking you to prove some uh, lemmas about these square roots. So here, you have to prove that the square root of n is equal to k, if and only if n is equal to k squared. 
Uh, and notice that uh, I can omit the name of this is square assumption. So instead of writing hn column is square n every time, because this argument is automatically implicit, uh, uh, is already implicitly inserted everywhere, I don't really have to give it a name. Uh, and you can omit all names for these implicit instance implicit arguments in square brackets. Now, by default, lean is not very good at figuring out uh, arguments of this is square instance. Uh, by default, it will only insert it if it's already in the local context, if it's already an argument to your lemma. Uh, but you, uh, what you can do is you can help it by declaring instances. So an instance is just a lemma, uh, which you, instead of writing lemma, you write instance. And uh, you prove that, for example, in this case, we prove that n squared is always a square. And the proof is very easy. So uh, if you go back to the definition of a square, we have to give a natural number k such that k squared is equal to n. So the natural number we give is n, and the proof that, well, this number squared is equal to n squared is of reflexivity. So this is the reflexivity proof. And now Lean will know that whenever we write n squared, that is a square because we declare this as an instance. So for example, if we write the square root of n squared, Lean automatically uses this instance we just declared to give this second implicit argument to the square root function. Another uh, nice thing is that instances can be recursive. So here's an instance saying that if I have two natural numbers n and m, and both n and m are squares, then the product of n and m are also squares. Um, and the proof is uh, not very hard. So as uh, the square root of uh, n times m, I use um, this witness, so the square root of n times the square root of m, and I prove that this squared is correct by using sim and giving sim this lemma to work with. And so now when, uh, when I write the square root of a multiplication like here, or in this example, like here, Lean will use this instance to uh, try to prove that it is a square. But for that, it also needs to figure out that n and m are already squares. So in this example, I have n and m, and I assume that n is a square, and I'm taking the square root of n times m squared. And um, this is a square because by this instance, I just have to know that n and m squared are both squares, and then one of them is a hypothesis, and the other one is the other instance I declared. So instance, uh, so, so whenever Lean has to um, figure out like an, in, uh, an argument, an implicit argument in square brackets. It uses this search, which we call type class inference, which is basically just recursively applying all instances you have declared and also using all local uh, hypotheses in the context uh, to figure out um, that like the class is actually inhabited so that n times m squared in this case is a square. Um, so this is what classes do for you. So you can um, use them to automatically um, um, let Lean figure out simple proof obligations. The emphasis here is really that the, the word simple here is really the emphasis um, because you should not expect type class inference to do like long proofs for you or anything. You should only really do it for simple proofs that you can just find by just naively applying like all instances to each other um, without worrying that, uh, well, and you have to make sure as a user that this search will never loop, for example, because if the search loops, then lean will just hang forever. So you should not use this as like 
a general purpose prover, but it's it's useful uh, for, for example, well defined in this condition or function. In Lean, we use this a lot for the algebraic hierarchy. So, for example, um, to figure out that the integers are grouped under addition, uh, Lean can uh, will use type plus inference to figure out uh, that Lean is a group under addition. But uh, you will hear more about that in the next talk. Um, so the rest of the file contains uh, a couple of exercises which you can do in any order. Uh, I want to show a couple of important bits of these exercises. Uh, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, but so here we declare the structure, uh, a structure called projection, which is a function uh, from alpha to beta, which I call two fun already using thinking of this as a projection. So this is the function from a projection to a function. That's why it's called two fun. And then I have the fields injective, saying that the function is injective, and surjective, saying that the function is surjective. So a bijection is a triple of a function proof that's injective and a proof that it's surjective. Uh, and we do two interesting things here. So first, uh, we declare a coercion here, has coe to fun. Um, and this allows you to they have like f of bijection alpha beta and apply it to an argument. So for example, here in this next lemma, I have f and g, which are projections from alpha to beta, but I write f applied to x. And really what I mean here is, well, the underlying function of this projection applied to x. And so this coercion allows you to, um, to automatically coerce like a projection to a function. And this, this is very similar to, um, to the up arrow we saw uh, when casting from like the natural numbers to the integers. Uh, this is a slightly different arrow because it's cast to a function, but it works in the same mechanism. And the second thing here is I'm proving an existentiality lemma for bijection. So, I'm, so this lemma here, states that if f and g are pointwise equal on all inputs, then they are equal as bijections. Um, and the proof is not very hard. Uh, the, uh, how I prove it is just I um, apply cases on f and g. And what that means is I'm just uh, destructing, like treating f as a triple of these three fields and also g as a triple of these three fields. Uh, the proof states gets a little longer. And then I use uh, a couple of tactics to finish the proof. Um, the proof is not a, uh, that important, but uh, the important bit is that I tag this with the x attribute. The x attribute teaches the x tactic to, um, to uh, this extensionality number. So now whenever you have two, um, two uh, bijections from alpha to beta and you want to prove them equal, you can use x and it will automatically apply this lemma. And then in that case, you have to prove the much simpler thing, namely just that the bijections are pointwise equal. And that will be useful for the later exercises. And so this thing where we, from a structure, we declare coercion and we apply the extensionality lemma that is quite common for structures because, well, quite often we have to prove equalities for objects in a certain structure. Uh, okay, then there are some exercises which I'll skip. Uh, and the last thing I want to uh, mention in this video uh, is uh, a couple more things about the structure command. So here I have an, uh, an example where I define a group in Lean. So of course, Mavlib knows what a group is and it's defined slightly different than this using classes. And you'll learn about that in the next session. Uh, but in this uh, here, I just want to, as a toy example, like show one way of doing groups. Just I'm just saying, well, group is a type together with an operation 
um, I'm giving this operation uh, a notation. So you can, in the middle of declaring a structure, you can declare notations for those, uh, for some fields. Uh, but it's important that this uh, notation is just survives for just this structure definition. So I actually have to declare this again after I finish declaring the structure. Uh, but it does allow me, for example, to write the associativity of, of the operation just using this nice infix notation. And then, of course, a group consists that has a, an identity element and inverse, an inverse function. Um, now, suppose I have this group structure uh, and I want to define uh, a structure of abelian groups or cognitive groups. Let me use actually the word abelian group here because. Oh, that's way more standard. Uh, so I have an abelian group and I'm saying abelian group extends group. Uh, and what that does is that abelian group is a new structure, but it copies all the fields of the group structure. So all the fields I had already declared, this G, this up, and all the other fields are also fields of app group now. And I'm adding one more field up com saying that the operation, this multiplication sign, is committed. Um, and this, this local notation is just to, to make the statement of this field easier. Uh, so this extends keyword is an uh, is a nice way to make uh, a slightly bigger structure from an existing structure. Uh, and then as another example, so here I define an explicit group. I'm saying that the rationals form a group. So it's a group with its underlying G, the underlying type, the rationals, uh, under addition. Uh, so the operation is addition, and then the identity is zero, and the inverse is negation, and then the axioms are given here. And now if I've already shown that uh, the rationals form a commutative group, uh, sorry, the rationals form a group. And now I want to show that the rationals form an abelian group. Uh, then I want to use all the information I already have here. Uh, and I can do that. So uh, in this structure notation, what I can write is dot dot, and then this red group. And this red group is exactly this uh, definition of the rationals as a group. And if I do that, I only have to specify what the new fields are of the extended structure. So I only have to specify this upcon. So I can still specify the old fields, but I don't have to. Uh, so I can end the, all the other fields, so the up and the it and so on, come from this other object I've already declared. OK, so that was all I uh, wanted to discuss in my videos. Uh, good luck with the remainder of the exercises. And I also want to uh, say that you can do all the remaining exercises in any order you want. So uh, we already saw the exercises about projections and groups, and then there's one more long exercise about pointed types, if you want. Have fun.